let me just say if at any point you have a question please just feel free to interrupt I, i'd rather you just interrupt than leave confused um, so i'm going to talk about mostly about these two papers here um, but i also make some connections to this one i did with neil uh, five six months ago um, and these two which should appear in the near future um, so I'll just give a quick outline just to place the talk into the context. Um, over the last year or so, uh, people have been looking at um, certain black objects, so black holes, strings, et cetera, uh, where they have this kind of a new type of horizon, which people have been considering, which are uh, horizons with some singularities, essentially. And most cases, these singularities are conical singularities. You can also get singularities which are far worse. Now, these singularities actually appear because these black holes that we're going to consider are actually uniformly accelerating. So, really, what you have is a pair of black holes which have been uniformly accelerated. And this induces for you a conical deficit because you essentially get some string attached in the black holes, which basically pulls the horizons and you get this conical deficit. So this is more like the, the bigger picture of it, um, of these things, but I won't really talk about why these is, uh, black holes are accelerating or et cetera. I will just focus on uh, basically the near horizon uh, thing. So one uh, thing that is probably somewhat surprising is that there are these uniformization theorems for uh, black hole near horizons, which basically states that on REMA surfaces in the UV, you can have some arbitrary uh, uh, metric on this REMA surface, so non-trivially curved, whatever you want. And then when you flow to the, ne the near horizon, uh, you get fixed to the constant curvature one. So these solutions actually evade this, these kind of theorems. And the reason why is because they have uh, singularities. And as we'll see later, um, Another reason why they evade them is that because in these theorems, they make some assumptions on how supersymmetry is preserved along this flow. And for these new solutions, these, this uh, assumption is no longer true. And this means that there are so, uh, new types of twists that you should consider for uh, preserving supersymmetry on uh, compactifications of uh, SCFTs. Um, another nice uh, feature is that even though these black holes have singularities, uh, if you uplift them into string theory and M theory, you can sometimes, but not always, remove all these singularities and the full uh, string or M theory solution is actually completely singular free and these conical singularities magically disappear. So let me uh, give a sort of field theory introduction and then completely ignore field theory for the rest of the talk. Um, so a lot of classes of SCFTs can be obtained by taking a parent SCFT, compactifying it on some space. Uh, so these are some of uh, the more famous ones. So you have class S, uh, which is just 4D theories from compactifying uh, 2,0 on a Riemer surface, and you can add in some punctures. And the important thing is that to preserve supersymmetry, you do a topological twist. You also have something which is called class R, which is fairly similar, but rather than a 2D Riemann surface, you can patify on some uh, 3D surface, which is hyperbolic space. And again, with a topological twist. Then you also have things such as the Maldacena and Nunez, which give you 2D and 4D SCFTs. So these were for um, D3 brains on some Riemann surface or M5 brains on a Riemann surface. And you also have things such as uh, 4D n equals two Hajiris Douglas theories, which can be seen as the n equals 1, 0 on some punctured uh, Riemann surface again. So these are examples of uh, RG flows across dimensions. So you have some uh, RG flow from some parent theory, which is in a higher dimension to the IR theory you end up with. Um, and a useful way of understanding these is to work out how these SCFTs arise from uh, some form of uh, brain configuration. 
So in all of these, they're fairly simple. Uh, they're actually a stack of brains. And then you have these particular brains and you wrap them on some curve, um, some, uh, uh, some surface, in these case, 2Ds, and this one in that case, it's a 3D. The other perspective of, of this is you can view this as some, uh, R, the RG flow is essentially you have some UV ADS theory and you flow to some form of near horizon where you have another ADS theory in a lower dimension. And this is more the perspective we will take. So just to uh, remind you in case uh, you don't know what topological twist is, um, if you want to place a theory you have, which is in R1D dimensions, and you want to place it on uh, something like this, where this sigma is non-trivially curved. Uh, if you just place the theory on this, this will actually break your supersymmetry um, because there's no covariantly constant spinners if this is, uh, is um, non-trivially curved. But you can do something uh, quite nice, which is preserve supersymmetry by performing what's called a topological twist. So what you do is you exchange the covariantly constant spinner uh, for something which, sat uh, Killing spin equation, which satisfies something like this. So this, these first two terms are just the usual uh, spin, uh, levy to beta connection for a spinner. And you couple, couple it to some background gauge field and by choosing this background, background gauge field correctly, you can essentially choose it so that it cancels off the spin connection here. And what you're left with is just a partial uh, act on the spinner. And then any constant spinner will do, and you preserve supersymmetry. So typically, you have to impose some projection conditions because of this gamma here, which breaks some of the supersymmetry, but you still have supersymmetry, and we're happy. So the important thing to notice is that the killing spinners you end up with are constant. And the way to do this is precisely to uh, equate this gauge field here, which you should think of as the gravity photon, uh, with the spin connection of the manifold. And this implies that uh, the, charge, the, the charge of this uh, gauge field is equal to the Euler character of the surface you're wrapping on, because uh, d omega is basically the Ricci curvature of your manifold. So for uh, that's essentially all the SCFT I will talk about until the very end. Um, so the gravity's perspective is, again, you have a UV, IR theory, ADS, ADS, and you have some non-trivial flow here. And you can kind of think of this as some black hole or black brain uh, configuration. Um, so, so generically, uh, this full flow is difficult. Uh, even in field theory, you have the same issue. You can work out what the fixed points are, but gener generally across the flow, you have no idea what's uh, happening here. And this is actually the same as we'll have in gravity. We're just going to consider the near horizon and not the full uh, flow, but I can actually uh, give you uh, the full solution, uh, but it's just not very nice looking. Um, so the final uh, point I should make clear, even though I said it before, is that almost exclusively all of these con uh, constructions where you have some flow across dimension involve a constant curvature uh, metrics. So if it's just the Riemann surface or these 3D hyperbolic ones, the metrics are always constant curvature in the IR. And people thought for a while that this was uh, always what you have, and this, what, this is what brought about these uniformization theorems. So in these, uh, there's two papers. Um, this is the first one. Uh, so they study the BPS flow equations for supersymmetric racked brains where they're wrapping them on some Riemann surface. They essentially reduced the problem to solving some total equation uh, for the UV and the IR. And you find that in the UV, you can basically put any metric on this Riemann surface. 
and this just means you can essentially modify this uh, the solution to the toda in arbitrary way. And what happens in the IR is kind of surprising, or maybe not, but you end up with just the constant curvature one. So all these degrees of freedom that you have for your uh, metric in the UV basically get washed out and you just have the simple metric. So this is, um, I don't know if you think this is surprising, um, but this result relies on a few assumptions and most people would say these assumptions are pretty general. And one of these assumptions was uh, that you preserve supersymmetry with this topological twist. But it turns out, which has happened in the last year, uh, I would say, that you can actually get solutions without these constant curvature metrics in the IR. And the reason uh, the assumption you need to lift is precisely this topological twist. So these solutions that we're go I'm going to discuss uh, have kind of um, given a new type of twist, actually two new types of twists that people should consider uh, when doing uh, compactifications of SCFTs. So I don't know if everyone knows what uh, a spindle is, uh, but it's actually this bit here, uh, and it's for um, essentially putting together uh, strands of wool. You twist it here and it gets wrapped on this, and this bit here, this whole thing is the spindle, but this bit here is what actually looks like the spindles uh, we'll discuss. So this is the uh, this is uh, an example of a spindle here. So this is the mathematician's way of describing what a spindle is. So you have um, a weighted projective space. You have two integers n minus n plus, and what you do is you take all the points in C two. Uh, sorry, you should mod out with the zero. Um, and you mod out by this relation here, where the power of this constant parameter here depends on the two integers from here. So if you set n plus and n minus to be one, this would just give you a uh, weighted projective space one one, which is the same as CP one, which is the same as an S two. So you've just got the whole uh, sphere of points which you projected out by doing this mapping. So when you change these powers here, this basically elongates the uh, sphere and you get some conical singularities at the points, which are precisely these kind of um, points here where you have conical singularities. So you can compute uh, the Euler character of this, uh, and this is what you get or you can write it slightly more suggestively. Uh, so this is the Euler character of the sphere, and these are the contributions from the conical deficits at each of the two poles of these spinners, uh, of this uh, spindle. Um, and you end up with this kind of cute uh, result here. And also you see that if you put n plus and n minus to be one, these deficit uh, contributions vanish and you just get left with the usual um, Sphere, uh, sphere result. So how can you uh, construct such a spindle? Uh, so there's actually quite a cute way of understanding uh, two important points about spindles. And one is kind of what they mean. And also the second point is that um, when I would discuss how you can um, get rid of these singularities, uh, this kind of illustrates the point quite nicely. So if you just take the canonical metric on a round three sphere, you can write it in these types of coordinates where I can write mu one and mu two could be uh, cos theta and sine theta, for example. And what we're going to do is we're going to rewrite this metric in a more suggestive way. So we can, can do a KK reduction along some non-trivial uh, u1. So I uh, take a linear combination of the two uh, circles in this parameterization of the S3, and I'm going to reduce along this funny combination. So you can rewrite uh, the metric, just some algebra, um, and you rewrite it in terms of uh, u1 vibration over a 2D base here. Uh, so this is really just d theta squared. Um, and then you're going to kick away this uh, 
simple. So you're going to kick away this U1, doing a KK reduction, and you're just going to keep this 2D base uh, in blue. So if you didn't do this um, reduction along this funny thing and you set M minus to be zero, what here you'd get is just the usual round uh, S2. But now that we've reduced along this funny vector, we get something different. So let's look at the points where uh, the poles of this solution. So these happen when either mu1 or mu2 vanishes. So when mu1 goes to zero, uh, just focusing on the 2D part, you see that this term vanishes here and we get um, this actually goes to one and we get just a n minus squared dividing the mu1 squared. And this tells you that you have um, period uh, two pi over n minus here. And if you do the same thing now at mu2 goes to zero, you find instead that it's now uh, n plus uh, squared. So what this means is you have conical singularities here. I can't pick a period uh, for this uh, chi, which is consistent at both points. So what you do is you typically, um, you assign basically uh, an orbifold uh, weight to each, uh, each pole, and then you can define uh, consistently a, um, uh, a well-defined period for these chi's, which, have, uh, which give you rise to these orbifold singularities. So this 2D base is singular, but this whole 3D space is actually non-singular and it's just the usual uh, S3. So with this uh, non-trivial vibration, you can basically desingularize what would have been a singular geometry. Um, the other point to note is that this, this uh, here, you can think of it as the gauge field and this defines for you how to de uh, this determines for you how to define a gauge field correctly for a spindle by taking the churn class of this. Uh, but I won't go into this uh, now. Okay, so that was a spindle. Uh, any questions? Okay. So what's a disk? Uh, well, a disk is a half spindle. So I can take this and I kind of just chop it in half. Uh, and what you're left with is this here, and you end up with a boundary here. So if you prefer more, uh, if you just use some usual topology, you could always flatten this out if you wanted, uh, but it's actually useful to think of it in this manner, because at this point here, we're going to put a conical singularity again. Um, so there's one endpoint, which is uh, R2, sorry, uh, mod ZK at this point here, and at the other end point, you just get what looks like a cylinder uh, with this circle, which is non-contracting. And we'll see shortly that uh, though this has some boundary, there's some interest in physics that happens uh, at this boundary here. So you can again compute the Euler character and you find uh, this here. Uh, so this is just the, the weight for the orbifold in here. And you can again write it in this suggestive way. So you have the Euler character of the sphere, you have the contribution from uh, the conical uh, deficit, and then you have a contribution from this boundary here. Um, and you can, uh, so uh, this kind of looks like the same as the spindle, but you just send one of the ends to infinity essentially. Uh, which is just opening up the endpoint here into this boundary. So the first uh, examples of spindles uh, came in this paper uh, from early uh, last year, where they looked at uh, D3 brains on spindles. And the nice thing about this was that um, they looked in uh, 5D gauge supergravity uh, and they basically, when you uplifted it to type 2b, uh, these solutions gave, were actually some known solutions from 2006, which people didn't know what to do with. Um, and so they were able to give some interpretation of these uh, 10D solutions, which had been lying in uh, basically dormant for nearly uh, 20 years. Uh, and the reason uh, why it was so difficult was because when you looked in gauge supergravity, it wasn't just these constant curvature metrics, but it was these non-trivial 
uh, spindle metric. So in the last year, uh, these have been extended to multiple different brain constructions, uh, and I'll give a table later, but for any, essentially any brain you can think, there's some spindle somewhere. Um, and on, in a similar but tangential uh, direction, um, the first type of disc appeared in this paper of the same year, I think two months later, and it was for uh, M5 brains on a disc. And whereas these papers didn't really consider field theory, uh, these people did a nice uh, example and showed that uh, this solution is actually dual to some 4D N equals to Argyris Douglas theories, which had so far been, um, uh, no one had really found any form of um, SCFT dual for these. So in a paper with uh, Neil and a follow-up with two PhD students in Utrecht, uh, we showed that these disks and spindles, which developed uh, kind of in parallel, uh, but no one really thought much of connection, we showed that they're actually related to each other in that these solutions actually come from the same, uh, a different global completion of the same local solutions. Uh, I'll make sure, I'll, explain that a bit better later. Um, and we showed in this paper where we considered uh, different ways of compactifying D3 brains on Riemann surface, we showed that um, you could also, you could get two types, you could get these constant curvature ones, and we found some um, one parameter deformation of some uh, uh, the Madison and Union solutions. And then we also found these uh, this disk for D3 brains, um, and it all reduced to solving some horrible uh, Mondrian-Pair equation uh, for this um, solution, uh, but we cheated essentially and did it by uh, making use of these this solutions here on spindles, and we showed that there was some link between these two solutions. So I'm going to talk about um, M2 brains because uh, they're quite nice and it kind of does the both pictures, uh, but you should take uh, have in mind that for pretty much any type of brain configuration you can think of, you can find uh, spindles. So we're going to um, look in a, con uh, um, a consistent truncation and this tr consistent truncation is uh, 4D U to one four gauge supergravity which is a consistent truncational 11D supergravity on a round, uh, well, on a deformed S7. So the uh, uh, action is fairly simple. You have um, four um, scalars, but they're related by one constraint, and you have uh, four independent gauge fields. So rather than trying to uh, find solutions of this theory, we noted that in some old papers, uh, we could uh, basically extract out 4D solutions from some 11D solutions by uh, doing some funny tricks with wick rotating and uh, dimensionally redu reducing. Uh, and you get these nice uh, 4D uh, metrics and, uh, and uh, sorry, you get this nice 4D solution. And I realized uh, later that these the solutions that I'm actually going to talk about, uh, you can actually obtain from the near horizon of some uh, 4D black holes, uh, which were found in uh, 2006 as well, I think. Um, but they're very ugly, so I won't bother uh, presenting them at all. So this is the solution that we're going to consider uh, for pretty much the remainder of this talk. Um, so we have just the ADS2 which we expect from the near horizon of the black hole. We have uh, two functions, which are cortics, this F here and this P, and they're related by this simple relation. And P also takes a simple form, which is just the product um, of four essentially linear uh, terms. Uh, and then these are the four um, scalars. And you see that if you take the product of the four scalars, you get one, which is this constraint. And then you have these simple gauge fields, which give you some magnetic charges. 
So everything's determined in terms of these four constants Li. So this is uh, good. This solves all the equations of motion, but it's not really a global solution. It's only local because not all parameters Li give rise to uh, well-defined solutions. So the trick now is to kind of to identify what parameters Li give you well-defined compact uh, solutions. So the way to do this is you want to fix the, the length essentially of W and we want to make it compact. So we have to bound W between uh, two points. And the two points you bound it through are through roots of this F of W. So it's quartic, so it has at least two uh, well, two, hopefully, two real uh, roots. And if you find uh, roots of F, you basically have something shrinking in the metric, and this allows you to, to uh, cap off the metric into a compact space. So you can plot uh, these two functions, and this one here is this F, and P is here, and you want to find some region, uh, which is this shaded in part here, bounded between two of these roots, and this, this is the region of your space. So now you want to see what happens at these points here. And if you expand uh, this metric on sigma around these points, you get this kind of behavior, which uh, is essentially R2, if you were to set this to be, uh, this prefactor to be one, and set Z to have a uh, period two pi. So if you did this for a sphere, you would precisely get a one here, and you'd also get a one here if you did it at this other pole. But the problem here is that when you evaluate it at the first uh, root here, W2, you get a different result to what to when you evaluate it at W3. And this says that you have uh, an orbifold singularity, and the way to essentially make it as symmetrical as possible is you add uh, some weights, which are these n plus minus, and you uh, determine the period of z to be this funny combination here. And you see, if I plug this in, I redefine a coordinate by extracting out this factor. Uh, this bit cancels with uh, this bit here, and I just get one over n plus minus squared. And this tells you that at these points, you have this um, conical singularities with deficit angles uh, given by these n plus minus. So this is going to give us this type of spindle behavior that I talked about uh, in the first slide. So just to uh, ease our minds that it's actually correct, you can compute the Euler characteristic and you indeed find this result here, which is what we had before by just studying uh, weighted projected space. So you can evaluate the magnetic charges. Uh, they take some not so pretty form involving the roots, but they're fairly simple. And amazingly, if you actually do the sum of these magnetic charges, uh, you find uh, this simple result. And you don't need to do anything funny with the roots. You can literally just uh, sum this together and obtain this. So sigma here is. Um, a sign and it's related to where this smallest root is. So if this smallest root is negative, so uh, the W equals zero line is this one, uh, sigma equals minus one, or if it's positive, uh, you get sigma equals one and the W equals zero line is here. So what happens if you set sigma equals one, uh, you get the same as the Euler characteristic uh, so you'd think this is probably going to be some topological twist. The Euler characteristic is equal to the sum of the magnetic charges, which is essentially the uh, charge of the gravity photon. But you'd be wrong. Um, I'll show you uh, shortly. And then more strangely, if you set sigma equals minus one, uh, you actually get that the Euler characteristic and the uh, magnetic charge uh, for the gravity photon are definitely not the same. You can't make them the same. So this can't be uh, a topological twist, yet these are supersymmetric solutions. So there's something funny going on. 
this is preserving supersymmetry in a way which is not uh, the canonical topological twist. So in the first paper, uh, we could find solutions where uh, sigma equals minus one, and these were fairly easy in this case, but the solutions for sigma equals one are somewhat more difficult uh, because you have to solve this um, this quartic here, uh, this quartic here being zero, and the easiest routes to find are the ones where they're plus and minus. Uh, but in the follow-up paper, I managed to basically uh, find all solutions to this quartic and show that you can find both plus and minus solutions for these this W two, and therefore you can get actually get both. You can realize both of these types of twists. So the uh, final thing, I, uh, one thing I didn't say yet, is that when you look at this metric uh, here, you can see that this isn't going to be the usual constant curvature metric you get on an S2. It's definitely something else, and it has non-constant curvature. So this is going in the face of this uniform uniformization theorems. Um, and the reason precisely is because that you're not preserving um, supersymmetry in this topological twist way that they assumed. So the second one is that when is this is uh, plus one and it looks like these are the same, you have the same uh, argument. You'd say, okay, this looks like a topological twist, but it's not constant curvature. So what's going wrong? And again, the issue is even though it looks like a topological twist and it acts topologically like a topological twist, uh, it is not a topological twist. Um, so people dubbed this uh, topological topological twist just to confuse everyone. Uh, so I would just refer to it as a twist from now on, this second choice. So this was uh, purely in 4D gauge supergravity. Um, we found that the solution has singularities and now you can uplift this on uh, a round, well, uh, a warped S7 and this is the simple uh, uh, uplift uh, metric. So you have uh, essentially an ADS2 and this 2D spindle here, and then a round, uh, uh, sorry, a warped S7, um, and a tedious but somewhat, uh, a standard but somewhat tedious computation shows that you can actually make this full 90 space of spindle plus S7 uh, both compact and smooth. Um, and then by smooth, I really mean that I've got rid of these um, conical singularities completely in this uplift. So this works provided that uh, these n plus and minus are relatively prime. And if you define these magnetic charges qi by this here, by extracting out these two uh, weights, then these pi should be relatively prime to both n plus and minus. Um, so though I didn't say it in the earlier slide, this is precisely the quantization you should impose in 4D if you studied um, the original uh, spindle here and how you would have made this well-defined. This quantization is precisely uh, what is happening in 11D to make this full 11D solution regular. So this is uh, quite nice. This is kind of like the generalization of this S3 uh, construction where you manage to get rid of the singularities of the uh, spindle by putting a U1 vibration, but you can make it more uh, difficult and use a S7 vibration. And again, you get a smooth uh, geometry. Um, so I can uh, just skip that. Um, so I mentioned that there's two types of twists. Um, and in uh, December of last year, uh, these three people proved that indeed there's only two possible twists under some mild assumptions. And they are indeed the ones that we had for this M2 brain. And this actually extends to any kind of brain on a spindle, not just M2 brains. And it's again characterized by the R symmetry of the gravity photon. Uh, and the Euler characteristic. 
and you again have the choice in sigma equals one, and sigma equals minus one. Um, so let's uh, discuss uh, the first choice, this topological topological twist where we set sigma equals one. So in this case, it looks like this is going to be a topological twist because the R symmetry flux uh, is precisely equal to the Euler characteristic, which you would expect for a topological twist. However, if you compute the killing spinners, for example, they're actually not constant. Uh, they have dependence. Um, and you can see when you look at the killing spinner equation, what happens, this uh, gauge field along the R symmetry direction is not actually equal to the um, spin connection exactly it's only equal when you integrate it over the full manifold. So um, you're not act exactly cancelling this off everywhere. You're cancelling it off uh, basically piecewise over the whole uh, manifold. And this is how you preserve supersymmetry. So this is why they called it this topological, topological twist, because topologically it's a topological twist. Um, and because of this uh, condition, uh, sorry, because of this condition, what you actually have is that you can embed this uh, um, geometry. Uh, you can basically embed the spindle into a Calabi-L fivefold, and then this full space is uh, Calabi-L, so you get a Ricci flat manifold. So this combines in with the uh, S7 that you have uh, and another direction and gives you this uh, Calabi-L fivefold. So until um, uh, this paper and my paper, I think two days later, uh, people didn't think you could find uh, these types of solutions for M2 brains, uh, but I actually showed that you can actually construct infinite classes of these solutions and they depend on how you assign uh, magnetic charges. So you can reduce everything down to six uh, parameters, uh, the four magnetic charges, and then these two orbifold weights, uh, but they satisfy a uh, condition because this is the sum of the P's and it's equal to a combination of the N's. And you can show that for this second, this type of twist in here, what you require is that you have these four magnetic charges satisfy this. So you have three positive or one negative or flip. I can pick three negative and one positive. And once you've picked this and you've satisfied the constraint uh, here, then you can actually compute infinite classes or families of these solutions. And you can compute the, uh, the free energy of these solutions and it takes a fairly uh, strange looking form where these p hats here are basically the symmetric polynomials of order two, for example, that you can construct from four magnetic charges. Uh, and then you just have the weights here. And this here is a number of M2 brains. Um, so this is uh, quite nice. Um, and I want to highlight that there is a plus here. Um, so, we can do the same thing for these anti-twists where we set sigma equals minus one. Um, and this is quite different despite a very simple, what looks like a very simple difference. You cannot actually embed these geometries into Calabi L fivefold um, as you could with the previous one. So this uh, 5D geometry that you would construct is no longer Calabi L, it's no longer Ricci flat. And it's precisely because this twisting doesn't cancel off. Um, it doesn't give you uh, this equal in this, which is the condition for being Calabial. Um, and the other way of seeing this is that to actually construct uh, super, uh, killing spinners, you actually need non-trivial global section of these all these uh, circles you have in the geometry. Um, this is more technical and I'll just ignore it for the rest of it. Um, but again, you can find infinite classes of families and the trick now is to pick two positive magnetic charges and two negative and then pretty much anything works. 
uh, and um, again you have a free energy it takes exactly the same form except you get a minus here so you can tell given the free energy uh, precisely what um, twist you did whether this is a plus or a minus so you can see if you just gave me a field theory with this kind of free energy you could in, you could immediately work out whether it's um, twist or anti-twist so this is um, just a summary of all possible uh, spindles that have been found so far in the literature so the red marks mean that you cannot actually find solutions of this form, um, at least conjecturally. Um, but everywhere else you have um, essentially lots of nice solutions. So the ones where you have uh, doubled, um, if you look at these, these are actually odd dimensional uh, spheres. You can, well, you can replace them with Saki Einstein, but let me just say spheres. These are actually odd dimensional spheres that you can construct and you can basically get both types of twists. But with these ones, you have odd, di uh, even dimensional spheres and they actually find you find that you can only construct um, uh, uh, these types, these, these twist ones. And whereas in both the M2 brain and the D3 brain case, you can actually construct uh, when you uplift it, they're completely singular free. Uh, for these ones, uh, they're not. These actually have conical singularities still, and you can never get rid of them. And it's related essentially to uh, being odd dimensional spheres and even dimensional in the way you can basically fiber these, uh, uh, fiber these over the spindles. Um, so recently as well, there have been types of solutions where you have not just a spindle, but you have some spindle times a Riemann surface. And one thing I'll mention in the conclusion is extending this to more general things. Okay, so that was my uh, monologue on spindles. Uh, any questions before I move on to discs? Okay. Um, so we're gonna do something very similar. Uh, so we want to again find some uh, global solutions from this same local solution. Uh, again, same metric, uh, same F and P. Uh, but now we want to do something funny and we're going to essentially tune the parameters here so that we make P and F have a common root. And you find that given the functions you have, this common root has to be at W equals zero. So doing this, uh, seems a tiny bit strange um, but a nice thing that happens is that you actually enhance supersymmetry by doing this because you set one of the gauge fields to zero and you actually need to set three equal uh, at the, to, to make this all nice uh, but this is this doesn't do anything for you um, but now rather than having something which is uh, n equals one uh, n equals two, sorry, you have something which is n equals four in 1D. Um, so this idea was kind of something Neil and I were working on with Achilles um, for the D3 brains, and we showed it also works for these M2 brains. So this is, uh, again, this funny disk. Um, and now we can look at the, the endpoints. So we have the same type of endpoint for this point, we get this uh, orbifold. But now when we look at this new endpoint, which is a common root of F and P, we have something uh, different behavior. Um, and we have this type of metric uh, when we go near to W equals zero. So rather than this uh, circle shrinking as it did at these orbifold points, and you can see this, this here is the Z uh, and it shrinks at this point, but it remains finite at here. And you just get essentially a cylinder with this bit here. But the slightly worrying bit maybe is that you have an overall prefactor which makes this 4D metric shrink. And this means that your manifold is actually uh, singular um, here. And it actually has a boundary here. So maybe even worse, I don't know. Uh, I know Neil's probably not troubled by this, but some of the dilettons uh, vanish uh, and others blow up. So 
uh, people probably would have asked a few years ago, uh, should we just chuck this solution away and uh, move on? Uh, and the answer is no. Um, so just before uh, I show you why, um, you can compute, um, again, the same kind of things. You find the Euler characteristic is 1 over k, which agrees with the uh, computation of the disk uh, from uh, most of the second slide. And you can also compute that the magnetic charge plus the Euler is non-zero. So it's proportional to the period of this Z. Uh, you can write this a bit nicer, but it's a complete mess. So I didn't bother. But, uh, and then the second point you can say is there's actually a gauge field along this boundary and you can compute its holonomy, which is just equal to minus of this. So again, you see that this is some new type of twist because the, um, the charge of the gyro photon does not cancel the Euler. So you can use uh, the same type of uh, uplift, uh, but in this case, you get a, something, a somewhat simplified version because you have set the gauge fields, uh, three of them equal and one to zero. And this is the metric you get. Uh, so hats here mean I've extracted out a factor of W. Uh, so these are um, non-zero when I send W to zero. And what you see is you have uh, a round S5, which is gauged. Uh, these D5s are gauged with respect to the gauge field, which depends on uh, DZ. So this is gauged over this spindle here, uh, this disk, sorry. And then you have here what's something which is topologically an S2, and it's essentially uh, you pulled it out to some extent. Well, it's not really, well, yeah, it's kind of an S2. Um, you pulled it out essentially from uh, this S7 by, by basically splitting off uh, a three and a one. So the way to actually view this solution is there's two uh, coordinates that the solution depends on non-trivially. So this W here and this mu here, and these form a rectangle um, in this form here. And you should think of this manifold as uh, this space as um, an S1 times, sorry, this is a S1 as well, uh, vibration times S7 vibration over this rectangle. Uh, and inside the rectangle here, everything is perfectly smooth, but on the boundaries here, special things happen. So here we have uh, one of the S1 shrinks and also here. And on this one, we have that uh, this five sphere, five sphere shrinks to zero uh, shrinks as well. And each of these uh, sides here, the, the generation is smooth. It's completely smooth. So this is somewhat surprising maybe again, because uh, for the 4D solution at W3, we had a, a conical singularity, but when you uplift it, rather than have a conical singularity along the whole of W equals W3, it gets shifted to this topmost corner. And similarly, you had, a, uh, you had some funny uh, problem at W equals zero in the 4D solution. And rather than having the same problem along this full line here of W equals zero, it gets pushed down to this um, corner here where mu four, uh, mu equals zero as well. So these two vertices are somewhat special. Here's something non, something singular, something very singular here, sorry. Something singular happens at both these points where everywhere else in this rectangle, including on the sides, everything shrinks smoothly. So let's look at the first special point, which is W equals zero. Um, so we moved the problem rather than from W equals zero to W equals zero, mu equals zero. So it's right at this corner. And if you expand the metric in this limit, what you find is that this is the uh, metric, what it looks like at this point. So you see here, you have ADS2 times an S1. Uh, and here you have uh, R3, and the rest of it is just uh, S5. And this describes 
the metric of an M2 brain if this had an R squared here, but because there's no R squared here, what happens is this um, M2 brain gets smeared along the directions of the S5 and is fixed at the tip of this R3. So even though this 11D metric is still singular, you have all these funny R equals zero problems. Um, this corresponds to something physical, which is an M2 brain. And in the field theory, this should correspond to some kind of flavor symmetry uh, when you can, you should be able to construct some quiver jewels of these theories. And this should, should correspond to some flavor symmetry, which essentially caps off the end of the quiver. So in field theory language, this actually corresponds to an irregular puncture. And this is you have, you can think of the disc as an S2 and you've basically uh, put a pin straight through the north pole of the S2. And this is what you would describe as an, uh, and then you can pull it apart and you get a disc. And this is an irregular puncture in field theory language. So the second special point was the uh, top right here. And if you expand around uh, this point, W equals W3, uh, nothing happens. But as soon as you put mu equals one, what happens is you get a monopole. And this, this is characterized by having something which is R4 mod ZK in the geometry. So this is basically you have an M2 brain and it's being probed by this uh, R4 mod ZK. And in field theory language, this is you have uh, your round S2, uh, you've put your puncture at the North Pole, this which opens it into a disc, and then you've put some uh, puncture at the South Pole, which causes a conical deficit. And this is how it manifests itself in uh, the 11D geometry. So let me just uh, give a short summary. Uh, so disks and spindles are intimately related. Uh, you can think of a disc as half a spindle. You just cut it in half and you give a boundary. So whereas the singularities for the spindles get up, get removed in the uplift, in the disc, we just move them to special points. But these special points give something meaningful, even though they're singular. Um, and you can compute the free energy of these. They look a lot simpler than the spindle. Um, but you have three parameters, the number of M2 brains, uh, the something which labels the regular puncture, so it's the orbifold number, and here something which labels the um, irregular puncture, which is the magnetic charge or the holonomy along the disk. So something that we want to look at is if we can construct the field theory dual of these M2 brains on the disk, but this is, uh, somewhat more difficult. Um, so I will just give some hint for the, M for the M5 brains. Um, so these are all the types of disk solutions. So here's the one I did with uh, Neil. Uh, and then here's the one I've been talking about here. And then there should be something to appear with the group here in the hopefully next month. So the field theories, we can kind of conjecture what should be happening. Uh, so this is the uh, 0, 0,1, uh, sorry, 0, 0,2 theory on this punctured di disc, uh, punctured sphere. And then you would conjecture that each of these can be computing a field theory to be something like for M2s, A, B, J, M on this punctured sphere. Or for D3s, we should have had N equals 4 on a punctured sphere. Um, so no one's really tackled any of these, uh, and it's something I'd want to attempt in the future. But let me try to explain in the last couple of minutes um, some of the story for the M5 brains and some of the work I'm doing at the moment with the group here. So in this paper by Bar, Bonetti, Manashian and Ardoni, which was the first one for these disks, they also identified what the field theory dual of these are and it's 4D n equals two Argyrus Douglas theories, which you can um, which you can um, label by this kind of funny SCFT notation. So this YK here 
tells you information about the regular puncture. So K is essentially the orbifold number from before. And this P here tells you something about this irregular puncture, which was uh, this uh, points, the bottom points of the rectangle from before. So they did uh, some checks of this. Um, I will show you the quiver shortly. Uh, and they used, to do this, they used some anomaly inflow techniques um, that they kind of pioneered. And they could, uh, with quite good accuracy, they could compare the gravity jewels with the, these type, these field theories, and they essentially get uh, matches for all of them. So roughly, the, the theory can be written as a quiver. Um, I kind of simplified it a tiny bit. Um, so you have these uh, round nodes, and you have basically uh, these square ones, which are flavor. And at every step, the rank of these uh, gauge nodes decreases, and then you basically terminate at a flavor node. So you can write something called a rank function for this, which basically encodes the uh, quiver in this nice diet, in this very simple diagram. And this is the type of rank function you have. So it's something which has just the single uh, slope up. You hit some particular point, which actually corresponds to this regular puncture or the monopole. And then from then on, you just have a slope down until you hit zero, and this terminates your quiver. So in uh, some work that we're doing here, we looked at if we could change these rank functions so we could have more flavor symmetries. And we can essentially, uh, these would correspond to disks with more regular punctures. So you could basically put these regular punctures wherever you wanted. And we indeed find that we can find fully analytic solutions where we have uh, essentially whatever kind of quiver up to some minor constraints and multiple uh, flavor symmetries here corresponding to uh, regular punctures. So I will conclude as it's, I have a minute left. Um, so I tried to explain uh, some recent work that's been happening in the last year, where people have been looking at black holes and black strings and so forth, where the horizons of these spaces are kind of uh, new things that people haven't really been thinking about, at least in ADS-CFT for uh, uh, before. So the uh, special thing is that these uh, Riemann surfaces, these spindles or disks, have non-constant curvature and they have singularities, yet these singularities are uh, both meaningful or can be completely removed in the uplift, and they give rise to sensible geometries despite these singularities. Um, and the way these uh, solutions are kind of novel for a field theory perspective is they introduce new ways of preserving supersymmetry that people haven't considered before in the uh, in the field theory community distinct from this type of just the basic topological twist so there's lots of interesting uh things that we can do uh to go uh, further so one which um seems fairly difficult, but is probably uh, very worth doing, is trying to understand these dual field theories. So for the M5 brains, this is fairly under control now, but for the, all the other possible uh, disks and spindles I gave, sorry, for the M5 brain disks, this is kind of under control, but for every other solution, uh, essentially nothing is known on the field theory, but for a tiny computation using an anomaly polynomial, which is basically telling you nothing uh, except the central charge. Um, so this is definitely worth doing for a field theory person, uh, but for more ADS-CFT people and stuff I, uh, I'm working on at the moment, you could consider rather than just 2D orbifolds, you could consider something more complicated like WCP2. So you have uh, just the usual CP2, but now you have three types of orbifold uh, points um, on this manifold, or you could even generalize this further to um, something with four, for example. Um, so we have some very uh, 
preliminary results uh, on finding these types of solutions. Um, I should also have something out very soon where we put these extra regular punctures. And it'd be interesting if you could do something similar for the D3s that um, I had with Neil, uh, because there's a kind of a, a nice formulation of these solutions in terms of some potential, and you should be able to compute generalizations of this potential to add in more regular punctures. And a final uh, thing I would quite like to understand is how to add in rotation to these disks and spindles. And this would, in the field theory, induce something like an omega deformation, and it should make the um, essentially a richer field theory as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you.